I had several magazines coming to Suge's club 666 after the fight that night. So I gave my ticket for the fight to uh, David Kenner for someone else. And so I was not at the fight. I was at the club. If I had gone to the fight, then I would have been in that caravan going to the club. And my son was with me. But I was early at the club waiting for these various news people to come in. And one of the security guards came over to me and very quietly said, Pop, you know, Papa G, um, Suge and Tupac have been shot. So here I go to the studio Sunday afternoon. It's about one or two in the afternoon. I haven't heard nothing. I'm waiting at the studio. Everyone, the runners, all the other engineers, producers, everyone's at the studio waiting. Next you know, we get, we're getting bombarded with phone calls, left and right. Did you guys hear? Did you hear what happened? It's like, nah, what happened? Everyone from death row is calling. Did you hear what happened? Did you hear what happened? I'm like, nah, what happened? Put it on MTV. Put the TV on. Turn the news on. Tupac got shot. It's like, what? didn't even wait for my car. I grabbed a cab and went to the, to the hospital. And I was there. I saw Sh uh, uh, Tupac only very briefly. And then I was in with Suge, talking to Suge. And his mother was already there. This was prior to uh, Afeni coming. And then the lawyers suggested that I get on a plane. And I came immediately back to Los Angeles and opened the office to start fielding press from this end. And I was in shock the entire time. Last time I saw him was on the hospital bed in Las Vegas, Nevada. But I want everybody to know that Machiavelli the Don was a soldier to the very end. Um, resilient to the very end. Uh, For those who weren't there, would have been proud of him to the very end. You know, he stayed strong to the very end. Tupac's story is a tragic story. Somebody who clearly had, you know, the talents of the universe and had an amazing burden of history on his shoulder, you know, and at the same time um, was locked into a situation almost or locked himself into a situation. We don't even know. You know, we can't ever know the real truth. Where his end was almost foretold in a way, you know? I mean, it, there's a lot of inevitability looking back on it now that he would meet the kind of end that he did. Right after Tupac died, I was working in the studio with Snoop Dogg on The Dog Father, and I did a little duet with Snoop Dogg that was basically an eulogy for Tupac, and they used some stuff Tupac did. But the bottom, the whole idea behind it was they were trying to bring peace to the hood. Snoop and Tupac and get out all the gangbangers, quit killing each other. There you go. Soldier's story. It is amazing how important Pac remains and how immediate he still feels years after his death. You can hear it in rap songs that don't even just come out of the West Coast. You got people that Tupac smashed on, Nas, Jay-Z. They talking about um, how much they like Tupac. I'm not going to say the guy was an angel, and there's people that definitely had their beefs with him because he was going to bring that t sort of drama and that sort of heat. Everything in the hood is about respect. The fact that he smashed on these fools on his music and years later they come back and do tribute songs to him says a whole lot about the power of him even in, even in death, even in transition. Pac was bigger than Pac. In death, Pac has been idolized. He has come to represent the ideal man who found ways to speak about a far from ideal world. After his murder, I was quite consumed with how he was being perceived as a 
Jesus-like figure, as a figure who was um, seen as a revealing, as a healing, as a divisive and destructive figure. So all that concentrated in one person. Everybody, I don't care who you are, when you look at Tupac, you kind of like, wow, I wish I could be like that. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people wish that they could be as free and as open as he was. The women loved him and the guys wanted to be him. Because of uh, the things he said and what he stood for, you know what I mean? I think that's why he, came, he became one of the most powerful uh, uh, hip hop artists out there, there was, because not only was he partying and having a good time, he stood for something. You know, you could think of him as like a, a hood professor, because you know, a lot of the times, well, for the most part, a lot of people in our communities aren't educated in the so-called school system, you know, about how to survive and what they're facing and who their real enemy is, you know, who's responsible for disenfranchising them, putting them in jails, you know, leading them to graveyards. But Pac spoke up on those things. He was, he was like the voice of our generation, you know what I mean? Like, basically, everything that everybody's going through that or that people want to say, he's saying it and saying I go through it too. And, you know, and at the same time, let me tell you about this. This is even more fucked up. I bet y'all didn't know this. From Brenda's Got a Baby to um, other songs like, you know, he expressed things in Dear Mama, um, other songs like Hellraiser. He spoke about all these different issues. But when you think about two pockets, you think about like greatness, you know what I'm saying? His, his skill level as a rapper was so tight that he could keep people's imaginations and keep people's interest and kind of like, you know, get that love from the community. You know what I mean? Because that's the way he was. He was an MC who was just the one guy, like a biggie, you know what I'm saying? Like guys that don't really come around too often and just have a gift. And their gift was to be able to put what's going on in the world and what's going on in themselves and write it on a piece of paper and put it to beats. Tupac was uh, a once in a generation type of person. And people, I think, recognize that um, from, the, from the very start. I can't compare him to Malcolm or to Martin except to say that they all had valuable lives. They treated every day of their lives as though every moment was important. So in death, Tupac has indeed become larger than life precisely because his own living has been terminated, but yet the life of his, um, of his image and his symbolism continues. At the time of his death, Pac was coming into his own as a powerful articulator and advocate of social injustices. People who knew him believe he would be using these skills in some way if he were alive today. Tupac said in the year 2000, I'm going to be sitting across the table from the rest of the other candidates running for president. I believe that that's part of the reason why he was assassinated. You know, I think Pac would have said, you know, we need to, he would have said something that a lot of folks in power would have been frightened about and found even dangerous. He would have been subversive because he came from that background. And if I can sell two or three million records, I can get two or three million votes. If I can get two or three million votes, I'm a contender. Personally, I definitely think he would be, you know, be politically active. Just the fact that we have a young black man in debates would have been big, would have exposed a whole lot. The fact that he got revolutionary consciousness and, and, and grassroots community consciousness would have brought a whole new set of issues to the table that John Kerry and George Bush ain't talking about. You know, he would actually be someone that, you know, anybody my age or younger would definitely identify with and almost trust him and follow him in anything that he said to do at this point. And I think he knew that he was moving towards that. I know for a fact he was on his way to being Machiavelli Records. If Tupac would have went independent, that's another reason I think he was assassinated. Tupac would have went independent, that would have changed the whole record industry. That's like Marvin Gaye going independent. That's like the Beatles or Elvis Presley going independent. Now what he was gonna do with it, not exactly sure, but I definitely think he would be doing something, you know, still in music, but very active politically. I mean, it was in his blood. For those who knew him and those who studied him, there was no question that Pac was at an apex at the time of his death. There is also no question that he still had a lot more to do. He was just transitioning to become an even huger cultural presence. 
through the means of his aesthetic appreciation and his artistic imagination, through film work, where I think had he lived, he would have been such a huge presence. So they had so much stuff, and look, they still have stuff that they're putting out now, you know. Within those nine months, I mean, he, Tupac completed a lifetime of, of work, musical work, as well as all of his writings, his poetry, screenplays that he was writing during his time in prison, that are now some of which are being developed by his mother and her company, you know, Amaru Entertainment, which is named for him, it's his middle name. Yeah, Tupac Amaru Shakur, and he, of course, is named for a tribe of uh, revolutionaries in Peru. So the legacy of Tupac is deeply entrenched in the psyche of the hip-hop generation. Now we go back to where he was at just before he died. Tupac Shakur lived passionately, fully and inspirationally. Moments were rarely wasted. The night before he was fatally shot, he was in the studio in LA before leaving for Las Vegas. Uh, we got a call, I think like two, like Wednesday or Thursday, and said, we're gonna do a song for the Mike Tyson fight. So, you know, Tupac wants to do a song, you know, Tyson talked to Tupac, wants him to do a song. All right, cool. And so we sat there for two days working on the music. And then on Friday, is it Friday? Yes. Fight was Saturday. Yes. So Friday, uh, Tupac was to show up and you know do the lyrics for it. You know, and finish it off. We mix it Friday night. They go off to Vegas and do the fight. The night of the session, Friday night. And I remember it was about it was early in the afternoon, about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Pac had been apparently at a, a video shoot all day. Um, we get the call. This should be there at a certain time. Have it all set up. Have the microphone set up. Everything needs to be up and running when he walks in. He would not walk into a room unless he was supposed to be there for a purpose. He ain't just gonna walk into a room and be standing around. He's there because he's needed for something. He was constantly moving. I mean, you know, he was recording all night. He'd be on the movie set, he'd come back. It wasn't like, oh, I'm taking two days off and getting a hotel room, you know, and relaxing. Hell no. Which maybe had to do with the fact that he, he always kept saying, I'm gonna be dead, they're coming to get me, they're coming to get me. So I think he wanted to get as much done as he could. He would sit there and have so much fun on the mic. You can just hear it in his voice. He's jumping up and down. I, would, I was looking in the vocal booth while he's doing it. He's jumping up and down, throwing his hands up, just all excited, having a good time. Comes out of the booth after we finish the song. He comes out of the booth. Is that it? We're like, yeah, that's it. We were just told to do one song. He's like, well, how long do we have the, the studio for? Well, we got it for 12 hours. All right, well, we got some time. I'm not leaving for Vegas for about another six hours. Why don't we do some more songs? I mean, you know, it's not like these rock and roll clowns that spend three days getting guitar sounds. You know, seriously, they don't spend three days. They spend about five minutes, if that. I mean, when they were done with a the rap, they pulled the mic down. I was playing a horn part. I better have it because there wasn't sitting there crying. My headphones don't sound right. I can't work under these conditions. You know, there's none of that. It was just intense, fast, you know, faster than 80,000 cars lined up at McDonald's wanting their hamburgers, you know what I mean? It was just bam, 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 bam. I remember one time, <laughs> I was telling you earlier, where he would like, turn, he'd want to turn the air conditioning off and make it hot like prison, and he'd jump around and shit, <laughs> and just totally get into it. Pac liked the flow. You necessarily didn't have to have the perfect part, but if it flowed right, you were cool, you know? And they moved on, so in retrospect, you could get two or three songs done a day. I mean done, ready to go to radio. But what was interesting was he would never, most people would come in the studio, hey, let me hear my last eight songs I did. He never even wanted to hear the shit back. He would never, like, ever request, hey, let me hear that song. And he'd never say nothing like, hey, you know, that mix ain't right or that shit. He didn't give a crap about that. All he cared about, like he said to me once, just put my vocals real loud and turn the drums up and I don't give a shit about anything else. On that last night working in the studio, Pac was relaxed and having fun, but engineer Scott couldn't believe how productive he was. So then the food and everything comes in, everyone's eating, everyone's having a good time, drinking. Next song's done. All right, I already got lyrics for it, let's go. Boom, runs in, does another lyrics on this other song. One thing I thought was interesting, 
Sometimes he'd, he'd write his lyrics down, we'd leave that, look at the lyrics. There was never a misspelled word, and there was never something crossed out, like, you know, keep rewriting, it was just all the words spelled correctly. The outlaws start running in, boom, 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 boom. Everyone starts going and doing their thing. All right, that's two songs, let's do another one. Get another one, Damon, come on. So next you know, Damon's off in the corner doing another song. About another hour later, Pac runs in again. Let me do another verse, da, 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 da. Starts writing out, gets on the, gets on the mic and starts spitting again. So just that, that whole night was just memorable because of the way how professional he was. What we got to admit in the end of the day is that the guy was incredibly talented. Bondi Curtis Hall, the director, told me that uh, when Tupac was acting in his film, Gridlock, that he was supposed to have written uh, a kind of spoken word piece, maybe 16 bars, lines to fit in uh, to the film. But Tupac had forgotten that he was supposed to write it the night before. So he said he sat down in 10 minutes, unerringly, uh, without any mistakes, any misspelled words, without missing a beat, wrote a rhyme, performed it, and he said he knocked it out. He said he was stunned. We always joke, we were 10 minutes, but action movie, we're action stars now. We run into stuff. And if you look at us, we look like the two most unlikely action stars in the world. It's always like we're the new, we always joke like we're the new. Um, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson. I'm the Mel Gibson, he's the Danny Glover. He was the kind of person that had so much to accomplish. Uh, I don't think he had a death wish, but I do think that he realized that he was going to die at some point at a young age, you know. I've, I, I used to tell him, you talk too much about death as far as I'm concerned, it gives me the willies. But no, I think he was not totally, let's put it this way, he was happy but not satisfied. Uh, because number one, he had so much that he wanted to accomplish and he was really, of getting more and more, as I said, into the acting and also into writing and the production of films and literature, poetry and things of that nature. And I think that he was feeling that uh, maybe his uh, stay at death row was coming to an end, that he had accomplished as much as he could there and that he wanted to move forward. Tupac never got a chance to move on from death row records. He completed his last death row album, Machiavelli, only weeks before he was killed. Since his death, hours of recordings from the past decade have been released. Given how obsessively Tupac worked, it is hard to believe that there isn't still much more to hear. The last project that he personally oversaw was the Don Columinati, the Seven Day Theory, aka Machiavelli. Machiavelli, which we, we did sort of tongue in cheek and it was not really to come out. And then after Tupac, Tupac was murdered, it did come out. But before that, it was going to be just sort of an underground thing. Something like Hail Mary um, uses the bells of, uh, that you would hear tolling at a funeral. Um, and all, the whole Machiavelli uh, soundtrack, he, it, it's, I mean, it's very hard not to think he knew he was going to die. But I tell you, the first time I ever worked with Tupac, it was a trip because uh, I didn't know his work habits, right? And so usually in rap, like after the guys do the beat, you put the tape on cycle and everybody smokes pot and gets on the phone, pages their chicks and all that shit and takes three or four hours to write their lyrics. So when we finished the first track, I was like, great, I can take a break. Then he comes back in, you better get in there, Tupac's mad. So I walk in, Tupac looks at me and throws his book at me with his lyrics and he's like, you mother if you ever leave this studio again, I'm gonna kick your fucking ass, right? And I'm like, dang, I was gonna smart off. Thank God I didn't, because he probably would have jacked me. It wasn't a peace, love, and happiness vibe. It was more of get the job done, you get it right, you're concentrating. It's like pro sports, you're not, you know what I mean? The next day he comes up with Timothy Roth, the actor, they were working on that movie, um, Gridlocked, right? So Tupac, totally different mode. He's got his suit on. He's playing this little, he's with all these white people and he's playing, he's about as white as you can possibly get, right? And I'm still kind of pissed from the night before, but he's got this grin on his face. And then he says to me, bet you're glad to say in a Tupac session, aren't you? I said, no, it's whack, man, I wanna, wanna make a record. And he said, from now on, you're my engineer. 
I said, okay, let's do it. I uh, was one of the engineers on his Machiavelli record. Um, got to work on three songs, songs 8, 9, and 10, uh, White Man's World, Me and My Girlfriend, and uh, Crazy. And then he walked in one day, and he said, I just got an order from Suge to do a diss album. So now he was in his diss mode. I'm going to diss everybody on the East Coast. So we were doing that for a while, but that kind of got old, you know, because, like, how many times you want to listen to somebody getting dissed? I'm going to get the people what they want. And what they want is the real stuff that they can feel. So then the album, which he said he had to have done in three weeks from an order from Suge, started to change directions from the diss stuff to the more political and social stuff. There's, a, there's sort of a flowering of his career during the mid-90s at the same time that hip-hop is kind of flowering as well within the mainstream and going global as well. Um, and I think at, at the time that he died, he was becoming a really, really interesting character. I mean, the Machiavelli album on the one hand is real deep and dark, and on the other hand, he had real pop type stuff as well that are coming out on death row. We're pulling off like um, the Hit Em Up song where he's dissing Biggie, which is cool because that became a video and a single, right? So that was cool, so we got out of that one. And then we took the Nas song off their friends, which I actually told him one night after I drank about four Hennessy's, I said, you actually sound stupid dissing Nas for three and a half minutes. He looked at me like I was crazy, right? I said, take it off the album. The four Hennessy's kind of helped on that one. So he said, all right, take it off. We'll do some more songs tomorrow. He left the studio, comes back in. He says, put that album, put that song back on the album. I said, sure, no problem. Boy, he had a lot to say, man. He was definitely a poet and sort of a, oh, what would they call it, a seer? Like, a, like almost like a shamanic seer, a visionary. I swear to God, he walked in five minutes later, he goes, you're right, man, take that shit off. We're changing the whole album, man. It's gonna be my Machiavelli album, which I didn't even know who Machiavelli was. And I was like, okay. And we're sitting there with the album, not even really mixed. And um, next thing you know, we get a phone call to head in to master it. And stuff isn't even mixed. You know, we just have the dat tapes from the nights of the sessions. And um, next thing I know, the album disappears and it comes out, you know, so like those aren't even really mixes, those are like from the session. Whether properly finished or not, Machiavelli has sold more than five million copies. The album before Machiavelli was All Eyes On Me, Pac's second release for Death Row and the first ever double album by a rapper. Pac's old friend, Money B, from Digital Underground, last saw Tupac when All Eyes On Me had just been released. So, you know, it was about at least nine months or so before he had died or whatever. And we went to the club, you know, and he was, he, he basically had a little section, bought, bought drinks, and then me and him were talking, and I was just telling him that uh, it was when uh, All Eyes On Me had came out. And I was just like joking, like, dude, you didn't call me to be on the album. He's like, you supposed to just come down. Everybody came down and blah, blah, blah. And he was telling me about, he had a lot more albums. Like he had already done a whole lot more music and that he had a soundtrack that he was gonna be in charge of and blah, blah, blah. You know, it later, I'll turn, later turned out to be the Gridlock soundtrack. Yeah, that's right. 100.3 The Beat, Harvey Hip Hop and R&B, B-Side Show. Hey, Sly on the two turntables. Eric Kubici right here holding it down on the MIC. Check it out. Y'all wanna holler at us, 888 one zero zero three inside is another bonus blast weekend we got money in our pockets to me all eyes on me was my favorite album because he was he had just already done his time he came out of jail and he had already i think before tupacalypse and those records were very raw he kind of hadn't lived life yet i think after he got put away for a minute he came back and he had already kind of thought about things and he had realized what was going on obviously an obsession to keep going, returning to the same themes, returning to the same set of agonies, and seeing if with this song he can come up with some kind of resolution. And of course he can't, and so he has to write another one. All Eyes on Me was one of my favorites, definitely. I've lost that thing about 30 times. I, either I've lost it or people have stealing, stolen it from my car, you know what I mean? I think everybody is only not, a, I don't think there's nobody alive that owns only about one copy of All Eyes on Me, you know what I mean? Everybody gangs them from each other, so. I got a couple right now I stole too, so whatever. <laughs> um, but that's what drove 
every great artist. And, and I guess that's why, as I said, uh, I'm willing to put Tupac up against anyone. Usually he was more social conscious, like you listen to Apocalypse Now, and even in um, um, Strictly For My Niggas or whatever. He had more of a message, like, all eyes on me was some gangster, gangster shit, like, fuck everybody. The way I, like, I had never heard him just be so much like that, and he was like, man, I just had to get that off my chest. Go, man. Everybody's always labeling shit. In 1995, only a year before All Eyes on Me, came what is regarded as Tupac's crossover record, Me Against the World. This was the first album ever to be put out by someone who was incarcerated at the time of release. With this album, Pac managed to create a commercial hit with artistic integrity intact. And, you know, you may listen to any song by Tupac and think, um, wow, all kinds of contradictions, I'm being pulled all over the place with respect to my sympathies. Uh, what is done to Tupac is often done to hip-hop culture in general. Either it's good and edifying and great because you say things that are not offensive to women, or on the other hand, uh, you engage in discourse that seems to be uh, altogether putting them down, and therefore you're scurrilously viewed uh, and seen as a, some kind of misogynist. You have the song he wrote to his mother. Uh, on the one hand, uh, things that are uh, you know, really paying homage uh, to women. And then you have things on the other side that say bitch. And those are the same times on the same album. So you say, well, there's contradiction there. For example, on Me Against the World, we got a song called Young Niggas. Where you telling, where you telling fools, man, you could be a doctor or a lawyer. You ain't got to be on the street selling dope. You know, I mean, that's the whole message of the song. But in Tupac, I think the contradictions are there almost at every moment along the way. We are being pulled up and down at, at the same time. And I feel that he did not know which way to go. Then he got another song, um, Dear Mama, where he's talking about, you know, his mama failed. He said, even as a crack fiend mama, you're still a black queen mama. You know, so I mean, he, when we hear that in the hood, you know, Pac Mama Dofi, my mom might be, or my auntie, or my uncle, I mean, in the inner city, most of us have relatives or parents that are addicted to drugs or were addicted to drugs at one time or another. The fact that he found musical ways of making those contradictions so palpable at every given moment, uh, his desire to be tough, his desire to be vulnerable, uh, which I think shows up in every phrase he ever, ever produced. Tupac wasn't the greatest metaphorical rapper. He wasn't the greatest, like, rhythm rapper, like a Rakim or something like that. He wasn't, he wasn't the best MC in terms of rocking a party. But what Tupac brought, I think, to hip hop was he was able to inhabit so many different types of souls. The beauty of Pac's voice is also in there in the mix. It's a voice that is very innocent. Um, and it often has an upward inflection as though it's questioning, as though for all the toughness of the words, there's still this child that has been damaged and that wants to be heard. Before these albums, the vulnerable tough guy had found himself in prison and a certain record label boss named Suge Knight came to his rescue. What happened was, Suge was interested in signing him, and of course he was an Interscope artist at that time. And from what I hear is that Jimmy Iovine had, uh, uh, was not too keen on possibly getting him out of prison at the time, and I think that's what made Suge decide to do it. And, uh, but when he did come out, when after Suge got him out, Suge totally concentrated on his career from day one, you know, and they became very close. Tupac had been in prison for an alleged sexual assault. In exchange for three albums, Death Row Records boss Suge Knight spent $1.4 million bailing him out, effectively ending Pac's stay at Interscope. No one will ever know if this was a fair deal. And I met him the night he arrived because we had a celebratory dinner party that night at a place called Monty's. And of course the next day he was in the studio and never stopped working until his demise, you know, from that day forward. What he did do that was very interesting was Tupac brought the work ethic at death row to an all-time high. I mean, everyone, everyone was scurrying then to actually do work when they would, you know, including Dr. Dre who 
really was, you know, would just take their time in the studio and so on. This was where Tupac's fast and rich living really kicked in. The death row months, while full of hard work, were also full of hard play. I recall we were shooting uh, at the Chateau Marmont Hotel here with David LaChapelle, and we finished one segment, and before we were going out to a location, Shadi said, Papa G, come with me, can we find a room where I can call my mom? So he called his mother up, and the first thing he said to her was, Mom, guess who I slept with last night? O.J. Simpson's daughter. He had met her at court when we were down at court with Snoop. And when he got off the phone, I said, Tupac, you, t you tell your mother things like that? Because, you know, that's the kind of thing I would never have been able to tell my mother. Oh, yeah, Papa G, we're real close. She got a big kick out of that. In, in some ways, she was a rock and roll archetype. We loved uh, um, shrimp. Shrimp cocktail, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he had three or four of those for breakfast. Tupac was living in Los Angeles now with his brother, Moprim Shakur. Well, we moved to LA in um, approximately like 92. That's when he got the movie with um, Janet Jackson, Poetic Justice. And I was his um, personal assistant on that film, so we were together like through the whole film. John Singleton, who was the director at the, at that, for that film, he had a hard time getting Pac up in the mornings for the interviews and things of that nature. And um, I was brought in to help get him up, and get him, you know, because we're from the street. In 1993 and 1994, Tupac had put out his important but probably underrated albums, Strictly For My Niggas and Thug Life. The mantra Thug Life was famously tattooed on Pac's stomach. Before moving to Los Angeles, from the age of 17, Tupac lived in Oakland, Northern California. Hip hop is about representing where you're from. And Tupac was from all over the place, but we like to claim him here, you know, in the Bay Area. Well, Oakland is the home of underground hip hop, independent hip hop. At that time, there had to be maybe two to 300 rappers who had put out their own music and at least 50 independent labels in the early 90s. For nothing else, Oakland is the home of innovation. Ghetto innovation. It was just like the Bay Area was on fire. And so was Tupac. He recorded his first solo album for Interscope at Hyde Street Studios in San Francisco. You know, his first album came out in 1991. And at that time, hip hop was still an underground type of thing. You know, most of the music was coming out on underground labels, independent labels, separate of the major label system. And his music kind of reflected um, that independent streak. I was doing a lot of work for Digital Underground, for the whole Digital Underground crew at this point. And um, I remember having a conversation with Tupac where he was like, listen, I'd like you to work on my album because I really like your mixes. They sound very street. DJ Fuse and Money B were working on their solo album. And Tupac came in and uh, did some guest performances on a couple of songs. And that's when we first met. He really liked the way his voice sounded and he liked the mixes that we were doing. So that's kind of what led up to our first album that we did together, Tupac Lips Now. And Tupac would like sit down in the corner, not talk to anybody, light up a blunt, um, and then start writing. And then this is what I think is fairly miraculous, what very few people can do. As soon as he was done writing, he would actually go out and be able to deliver his raps, to actually do the vocals in one or two takes. Tupac's debut album, Topocalypse Now, sold gold. The stepping stone to a solo career was his membership of Digital Underground. These guys were like his family, they supported him creatively and spiritually. They were 
at the beginning of kind of the heyday of the Oakland hip hop scene? I remember that um, I was living in Oakland and he would call me and he was like, you know, yo mom, I'm on the road with digital. They hired me, I'm on the road. So when he got on the road, and people think that he was a roadie, he wasn't just a roadie, you know what I mean? He basically came to assist us in whatever we need, needed to happen. So he would sometimes carry whatever he had to carry, but he was also part of the stage show. And we used to joke about it being called the, under, the Underground Railroad, where uh, an artist would join Digital Underground for a while, get exposure both touring and on, on albums, and then kind of jump into their own thing. And we made sure that we allowed him, you know, a part of the show to you know, the rhyme or, you know, he had parts in the show. And he would also, you know, do the Humpty Dance, dance when we needed to do the dance, him and I. Tupac definitely uh, was the artist who, uh, you know, kind of made the most of that kind of transitional period of being with Digital Underground. And he said it like that was the, the last fun, for really fun time in his life. The first time I saw him perform with Digital was around here, like at the rehearsal spots. We all rehearsed together. When he first came on the road, I was like, you know, it was like, if we're in a hotel and like, let's go get something, shrimp cocktail. So we just had a good time. We had wild parties. Digital Underground through the wildest parties. <laughs> Where he would shine is like afterwards, you know, back at the hotel, if there was a piano or whatever, if there's a freestyle battle, he was always in it. Shock would be playing piano or anybody would beatbox or whatever. He was down there. If anybody would listen, he was killing it. Him, uh, Latifah, I don't know if you remember group third base. Search could freestyle really good. So by the time we got off the road, all the other groups knew about Tupac and they were like, man, what y'all gonna do with this dude? Shortly afterwards, the opportunity came for us to um, do the song, same song for, for that movie. And uh, Shock was like, hey, you know, do a verse. And he, the rest is pretty much history. To be honest, when he did start to blow up, I wasn't really surprised, you know? I mean, it, it didn't strike me like him. It was like, you know, you just, I don't think a lot of people were surprised. He, he had a certain way about him. You know, I, I can remember going to a radio station one time. This was before he was on a record, but you know, we just take him along. And I took him over to the radio station and, you know, we freestyled on the radio and then um, they were like, call in to talk to Digital Underground. Tupac and Money B. But all the calls, everybody was asking to talk to me. And he was like, man, f this shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do this. And he was like, man, he's like, wait, when one of these days, they gonna be calling for me. But he used to come through the station and he used to do a lot of stuff for the community here. Cause we had a community action department. So they used to always get whoever would wanna get involved with the hood and with the ghetto and with the barrios. And he was always wanting to show up. You know what I mean? That was right, right, actually that was before, right during the whole digital underground thing. And then he went away, and then when he came back, he was still messing with the beat. Let's go to the phone lines real quick. Yo, the beat, what up? Even in the beginning, Pac expected everyone to do their job perfectly. If they didn't, he wasn't going to stay quiet. Check it out. I motivate the crowd. I like my music loud. And we had a show in like, in Augusta, Georgia. I think that was our first show. And at the sound check, the sound man for the whole tour, he did something. It was something that, you know, we were upset about. And Pac just went to rush the sound man and like went to swing at him, like trying to knock him, knock his ass out. And right as he was swinging, Adrian somebody grabbed him and he just barely missed the sound man. And we was like, dude, you can't beat up the sound man. You know what I mean? That's our whole show. That's you crazy. We always like, no, one thing we used to always be like, and he used to hate him, we like, calm down. Cause we used to always tell him to calm down. He used to get upset, like, I'm not calling, <laughs> you know? Cause we always like, calm down, too fight. And he'd be like, that. And in turn, Digital Underground blessed him with the opportunity to do Juice, his first feature film, which he was a star in. Actually, my brother was gonna come on the road and Tupac took his place. So I kind of was a little resistant at first, but you know, you know, from the time that we first met, 
whenever Tupac would come to Oakland to come record or whatever, he would come to my house because out of the group, we were the closest in age. We were only like a year apart, so we were, we, you know, we were pretty tight. As far as the group, we were probably the closest, you know what I mean? And so he would want to come over and make tapes and everything. And of course, was the girls, the drinking, and whatever. By 1990, Pac had made his mark and was gaining notoriety. Tupac became a member of Digital Underground after his own group, Strictly Dope, split up in 1989. First time I heard of Tupac, he was in a group called Strictly Dope. They were managed by Layla Steinberg, who was friends with our manager, H. and Gregory, TNT Records. And basically, um, they set up a meeting for Strictly Dope to come audition for us to see if Adrian wanted to sign them to TNT Records. The group he was involved with at the time was Strictly Dope. And my man Ray Love, DJ Diz, um, a few artists from the Bay Area, good friends of mine, and uh, they they were his, his, his core at the time. And, you know, we just nurtured each other. Tupac, he stood out, you know what I mean, even, even back then. There's something about him that was a little extra, a little more intense. He commanded the attention of the room, basically, whenever he opened his mouth. <laughs> and he made sure of that. <laughs> um, believe in yourself and don't let nobody stop you from doing what you got to do. You got to have faith. If you, if you can't find faith in the world, find faith in God, find faith in yourself, but you got to have faith. I just remember, like, you know, who are these dudes? They're all right, but that dude right there is, you know, he got something. Well, the first time I came across Tupac was, um, firstly, I, I met his brother, Mercedes. He, he, he rapped on a song of ours called Feels Good. I had already had a hit out, you know. By the time we hooked up, I had already done my first record, my first hit. I more or less kicked it with his older brother, so I, know, I knew he, he was good stock. You know, his brother was a solid person, too, and a, a damn dope rapper. We hooked up, and I'm his older brother, so he's a, he was inspired. He was, you know, looking at me for advice. Soon afterwards, um, H and did eventually sign the group to TNT, but things weren't moving fast enough for um, Tupac and the guys in the group. So eventually, they broke up. And everything that positive and good that came up, I'm like, yeah, go ahead. I lived in the Bay Area at the time. I knew Digital Underground. Tupac was ready to quit rapping and move to Atlanta to be part of the New African Panthers or some political group he was going to get involved with. And he was basically like, if something doesn't happen for me now, I'm leaving. I'm, you know, I'm done. So what Atrium did was ask if we could take him on the road with us. He told me he was getting involved with Digital Underground. I was like, yeah, good, do that, do that. Go, go, go. Everyone who knew Pac remarked on his intelligence, his hunger for knowledge and the breadth of what he knew. We had a very close relationship. Uh, he was an intellectual, he was very well read, and he read all his life. It wasn't just that he had read things like Machiavelli and, and the, uh, the Prince and so on when he was imprisoned. He could speak about, you know, film and Shakespeare. As a matter of fact, his mother, Afeni, punishment for Tupac in the early days of New York would be to read the New York Times from front cover to back and then to report on it. A painting and thespian art. And he could talk about uh, romantic poetry and metaphysical poetry. I mean, the guy was incredibly intelligent. He read a lot. He wrote a lot of poetry. He was incredibly smart. He read a lot of the books that he talks about in his raps. You know, he read the, the Prince and Machiavelli and all that. So he wasn't just quoting stuff out of the sky. The man really sat down and read some of those books. A lot of people don't know that Tupac had gone to the uh, Baltimore School for the Performing Arts, where he studied ballet and acting and all those things. So he was really well versed in all kinds of, you know, of life. Also, Tupac was a martial artist. And occasionally, once in a while, he would show off some of his uh, martial arts techniques in the studio. He'd sit in the back of the tour bus 
like I remember when Mariah Carey first came out and listened to that so that song. I don't know, was it was it Vision of Love? One of some slow shit. And I wasn't digging it. And I was like, man, when you turn that shit off, he's like, you don't understand. This is good music. Uh, so uh, there were some uh, cinder blocks lying around in the room, and he wanted me to hold one so he could like break it with his foot. And I was just like, oh my goodness gracious, boy, I'm not sure I'm up for this one. Um, and boom, just like that, I didn't feel a thing. Cinder block broke in half. As a young rapper, Tupac was a local celebrity in the Bay Area. From birth, it was instilled in him that everything he did needed to be part of the struggle. This meant everything was done with fight and passion, and therefore, risk. If you're going to talk about Tupac, you have to look at the entire individual. And you have to really look at some of the things that are now just coming to fruition. The fact that he was in a writing group, um, you know, with Ray Love, when they were with the group Strictly Dope. Um, in that writing group, he had incredible poems, you know, The Rose That Grew From Concrete was the name of the book that they put out. I remember telling Aitchin one time, I'm like, man, he, he could be, you know, he has the potential to be really, really big, but he also has the potential to blow it really, really big. This was way back, this is before he recorded anything, it's just like, he was just, you know, young and wild. I had a lot of energy and had a lot to say. He was one of the people that was helping start this after school program with his first manager, Layla Steinberg. Right now we're driving through downtown Berkeley, Berkeley, California, home of the revolution. You had like this police crackdown that kind of lasted for a few years and Tupac actually got caught up in that because um, I think, I can't remember exactly what the year was, but in 1990 or 1990, 1991, he got picked up and harassed by the cops and beaten down over here on Telegraph Avenue. Really, when I remember having a conversation, may have been after he got beat up by the police. I remember seeing that. And he came to this place called the Omni, and he had these scars on him. And he was just on some like, man, they're going to pay. I'm going to make sure they pay. I think it was probably on this block that Tupac was actually beaten by cops. It turned into a big case because people knew who he was. He was a celebrity around here. People knew he was you know, down with the Black Panther Party from way back in the day. And I think Tupac was raised with the attitude that if something like that happens to you, you don't sit around and moan about it. You make noise. Today, every, every young black male needs to be physically inclined and military minded. And this is part of the military mind. The soldiers are out there. Tupac had always been surrounded by politically conscious people. Uh, a lot of people see Digital Underground as Humpty, but they don't know that before Digital Underground became Digital Underground, they were a group called the Spice Regime. And the Spice Regime had plans to be the Black Panthers of hip hop. Um, unfortunately, there was another group that kind of took on the uniforms and the attitude and the mannerisms that Digital Underground, when they were the Spice Regime, were headed towards. That group was Public Enemy. Both of my parents, his mother, of course, but my father was in the Black Panther Party, so we kind of connected on that level, too. The second thing that Oakland is known for is the home of the Black Panther Party. My mother, she, Miss Sharon Harding, she, um, she made sure I was safe, so she moved me around the country to prevent the federal government from just harassing us. Pac's mother did the same. So we were out of communication for a long period of time because my father was on the ground. Um, he's in prison now, Dr. Matula Shakur. He's in Atlanta, uh, United States Penitentiary for, he's a political prisoner. Well, Afeni Shakur was part of the Black Panther movement. And as we know, in the 1960s and 70s, the broad movement for social change that was motivated by the civil rights movement on the one hand and the black freedom struggle uh, more broadly. The civil rights movement was an attempt to find sure footing for black people in American society where their 
social rights would be protected and their civil rights would be regarded. In the meantime, while Pac had been dealing with the struggles with his mother and you know what they were going through, I was dealing with my mother and what we were going through, you know? Pac and his brother Mo Preem met up again in Oakland after years apart. And um, when we finally met up, again, we had the same things in common. We were still related, and so we carried it on. It was like a Thanksgiving in 1989. Afeni, his mother, had called me and told me to come and see your brother, see your sister, my sister, Setua, and um, I was living in Oakland. They were in Marin City. He was just coming out of high school and that type of thing. And so he gravitated towards me for some type of, uh, you know, stability. And uh, fortunate enough, we were both involved with, in the arts. And um, we inspired each other. Even though he was from a, a lot of different places around the country, Oakland is who gave him his start. He never forgot that. Oakland is also who gave his mother her political start. He never forgot that. West Side, Thug Life, Outlaw, Immortal, strictly represented. Being a child of the Black Panther Party shaped Tupac almost entirely. Our family was tied up in the struggle, in the civil rights struggle in America. And as Tupac was growing up, he saw some of this. He heard stories of this. His mother suffered as a result of not being supported uh, by a male-dominated, uh, machismo-centered leadership that didn't concede the importance of the work she did, ultimately. There was some, you know, neglect only because our parents were on another mission. And so they were eventually homeless and lived from home to home and place to place. I think Tupac, by the time he's 14 or 15 years old, has moved, you know, 15, 20 times. And um, it was a rough existence for him. The hardships that Pac saw and endured inspired his coining of the term thug life. Tupac had a dream. Uh, at the time, my father was in prison. Tupac and I were living together, and when my father would call, we all had a discussion about thug life and what it should mean and what it should mean. Through the midst of those conversations, we came up with the hate you gave little infants fucks everybody. His whole idea of what a thug was, his thug mansions and his thug life really meant the life that young guys in his community and so on were forced to live. Thug life, thug life. Both the inheritance of the black freedom struggle was very important to him, but also seeing how they were abandoned in the aftermath of the extraordinary contribution their mother had made uh, to the movement gave him bitter lessons about the moral ends of social struggle. So he was uh, informed quite early about the contradictions in these struggles. The differences between the Black Panther activist and the rap star are not so great. Everything from style to outspokenness to fearlessness is comparable. But what's interesting is that in hip hop music itself, especially the kind of thug persona and the thug romance that Tupac himself subsequently embraced, owes its roots and is credited to the images that were put forth in the Black Panther movement and when the thug on the street, the persona of the sexy rebel. And Tupac certainly embodied that. The Panthers in the civil rights struggle that we were involved in, they were, you know, attentive to, to the arts and they were attentive to that type of nurturing. And so, um, even though we separated, that was still instilled in us. From a young age, Tupac's gift as a rapper became his way of teaching others about the harsh realities of life. That what his mother taught him and what the Black Panthers gave him was a vocabulary, a grammar of social justice. You know, with rappers, all of a sudden people are like, these are our political leaders, these are our Malcolms and these are our Martins. I mean, when you think about even some of his music, just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops, and to this day, 
them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out, so we pan the pigs to knock the blacks out. So you don't need to study uh, you know, Marxism 101 to understand that he understood that you were virtually subsidizing your own oppression. People that's not attracted to that kind of music, he would go get at them where they was at, in gangster rap, in, in club music, and put some consciousness in there. And at the end of the day, you know, I mean, they, they know more. And he snuck the consciousness in there on them. Wow, this guy was really doing some things. The fact that early on he was talking about how to bring about social change at 16 and 17 years old, coming up with ideas that we need to all be thinking about. He wasn't just like, well, I'm just gonna try and see how I can get on. He was like, man, you know, one day we need to, you know, maybe have the president stay in an apartment and let everybody who's homeless in D.C. live in the White House. He got a lot of his charm, intelligence, and firepower from his mother, who as a young woman who's pregnant seven months um, or so in the court arguing for the issue of social justice and for the ability of the Black Panthers to be able to do what they do without the tyrannical surveillance or the breakdown of their movement by, uh, by the local police and the FBI. I was brought up, brought up on this hip hop shit. And everything I learned, I learned straight from it, but now I'm caught up. Before Oakland and a brief but happy stint in Baltimore, a young Tupac named Lesane Parrish Crooks at birth lived in New York City. Harlem, USA. 120th and morning side. You know, for those who know, you know, it's in the heart of Harlem. I mean, my earliest memories of him was when he was like two when I was like four. <laughs> you know, we have different mothers, but we have the same father, you know. It's not Pac's biological father, but my father raised Pac. We both grew up with thinking that my father was, was our father. Whatever knowledge we can pull from my father, we, we did. And uh, Pac pulled a lot from my father. We got to be little together, you know. My father taught me to look out for my little brother, and that's what I did. My father, he observed us from afar, you know. He, he wanted to know how we were doing. He would check up on us. He, you know, I remember times in Queens where he would um, just drive through the neighborhood, and he would come through, give me some money, and keep on rolling. Tupac's revolutionary destiny was foretold even before he was born. Tupac was born barely a month or two after his mother uh, won the freedom for the Panther 21. And so Tupac <clears throat> said his embryo was in prison. So uh, from the very beginning, he inherited this impulse to defend yourself, to be articulate, to use your education and your intelligence as a source of uh, not only protection of your own family, but to defend black people. He knew he was in a position to make a difference. So if he was in a position to make a difference, the mission was to do what we have been taught, you know, as children of the struggle, as children of parents who were in the Black Panthers. But he was a really a, a w really well-rounded individual, and I still, you know, I miss him. I miss having conversations with him. He took everybody who we met, everybody we met in the studio, especially um, for what they were. He didn't, you know, wasn't about to like give you a hard time because of this or because of any kind of preconceptions that he had. My son was a magic person, a magical person. In our personal lives, he was our star. He made our whole lives shine. Okay, uh, you know, he was a fighter and he really wasn't afraid. He was also fearless. He didn't care if the government locked him up or if he got hit with a fake murder rap. 
He almost, you know, that's what the whole Machiavelli thing's about. Whether he was acting or whether he was talking about the Black Panthers or whether he was speaking about police brutality or whether he was talking about racial or economic inequality, he brought such a passion. Tupac, you know, was a genius. He really was, you know. I always told him, I said, Tupac, you remind me so much of Miles Davis. They were both Geminis and very similar. But I think that he will be seen in the future generations, uh, remarkably so, as an artist of significant achievement who deserves to be placed in the pantheon of great American literary figures. A lesson that I learned uh, from that is like I told you that we were all proud of him. I never got to tell him that I was proud of him. Respect means everything, but for you to have respect. He's lying. He's lying. Don't believe him, he's lying. <laughs> what's up, Too Soft? What's up, Too Yo, what's up, man? You gonna get a new one, though? That's kinda old, though. And so, lesson learned is that, you know, now, I always try to tell people that I appreciate them while they're here, you know what I mean? Because when they're gone, it's, it's too late. Basically, the dude's a genius. I'm happy to be here. I just love the crowd, the atmosphere, you know.